public notice and no public hearings, the Federal Aviation Administration has decided to let airlines make a change in 747 jumbo passenger jets, a change the airlines say they want and need to cut costs and get rid of a maintenance headache, a change the chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board says, quote, will reduce the safety of the aircraft. Peter Van Sant has been looking into this jumbo jet jumbo controversy. At 231 feet from nose to tail, the 747 is one of the largest aircraft in the world. During typical peak travel times, more than 430 people are inside. To get them out in an emergency, 10 exit doors with slides are built into the 747. But now, without any public hearings or new testing, the Federal Aviation Administration is allowing airlines to seal off the overwing exits, creating a 75-foot gap between the nearest exit doors. Critics say that in an accident, that distance could be fatal. Uh, that's just too far to go when there's smoke, fire, gas, and panic. They're just not going to be able to get out. Escape from a burning plane like the Air Canada jet in 1983 is difficult. Uh, smoke was so thick, you could barely see in front of you. Airline consultant Sharon Barthelmas studied the Air Canada accident. She says that in similar smoky conditions, it would be physically impossible for anyone to travel 75 feet to find an exit. 13 out of the 23 people who died in that accident made a very definite attempt to escape. However, those people only were able to travel a distance of between one and six rows. Criticism of the FAA's action has also come from within the agency. One official of the Protection and Survival Laboratory, who asked not to be identified, called the exit door decision disastrous. Critics were also surprised that the FAA did not order a full-scale evacuation test, like on this 10-door 747, to see if eight exits are enough. I think it is a terrible mistake. It troubles us that they didn't do the test. It troubles us that they didn't come to us before they took this decision. The FAA declined to talk about the exit door issue. The agency did provide a letter in which it stated that removing the two exits meets all the safety standards and objective criteria in our regulations. But Kevin Sherry, who recently evacuated a panic-filled 747 in Detroit, says passengers need every exit they can get. If the doors did not open, I would think that there would have been a real problem on their hands. Four foreign airlines, most notably British Airways, have decided to seal the overwing doors. Removing the doors eliminates about 800 pounds, which can help save fuel. U.S. airlines are studying the change. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Atlanta. The Pentagon today announced the first ever test of so-called Star Wars technology to be carried out with the help of the space shuttle. Next month's voyage of discovery will feature what's being called a high-precision tracking experiment, a test of technology that eventually is supposed to be able to destroy enemy nuclear missiles before they can reach targets in the USA. In the library of the U.S. Information Service building in Seoul, South Korea today, some 75 students began a sit-in protest and said they would kill themselves if police tried to evict them. The students say they're protesting what they insist was U.S. support of a military crackdown five years ago in the provincial capital of Gwangju. 189 people were killed then. This spectacularly scenic city of Seattle will fool you in more ways than just with its changeable weather. For example, much of the country agonizes over a U.S. trade deficit that has ballooned to $130 billion since Asia replaced Europe as our leading trade partner in 1981. But the view is different from Seattle and other Pacific Northwest ports. Richard Wagner explains why. The trade shift to Asia and the resulting monumental balance of payments deficit for the United States may be bad news in many parts of the country, but it's a boon for the shipping industry in the Pacific Northwest. We are, in fact, uh, the leading port of entry for 18 uh, Midwestern states for cargoes coming from the Far East. One state to the south, more Hondas and Subarus come ashore than any place else in the country. In the last four years, the value of Asian trade moving in and out of northwestern ports has risen almost a third to $30 billion. Just last week, the governor of Oregon was in Tokyo drumming up business. Uh, Japan has been our number one trading partner, and it's our intention and hopes to expand that, which of course means jobs for people who work in my state. The trade does go both ways, but this just emphasizes the balance of payments problem. 
the boatload of logs shipped to Asia is worth a lot less than the boatload of television sets that comes back. The state of Washington is more dependent on foreign trade in both directions than is the economy of any other state on a per capita basis. That fact and the growing sentiment in other parts of the country for trade sanctions against Asia has people here concerned. If things really go bad for an open trading system, the U.S. is going to be hurt somewhat, but the Pacific Northwest is going to be hurt more. So, for the moment, this region enjoys having the closest mainland U.S. ports to Asia, but it can't ignore the fact that the Pacific Northwest's economy is becoming more and more tied to trade with the Far East, while the future of that trade is becoming more and more uncertain. Richard Wagner, CBS News, Seattle. With that Richard Wagner report, we inaugurate our new CBS News Pacific Northwest Bureau. The Bureau will provide you and us with better coverage of this vital and growing region. Moments ago, a federal mediator in Chicago announced major contract issues have been settled in the eight-day-old strike by 5,000 pilots against United Airlines, the nation's largest carrier. The mediator did not call it a settlement, at least not yet. However, with the major sticking issue of two-tier pay apparently out of the way now, what remains, one source said, is how to get United Airlines people back to work and the planes back in the air. The one-pound infant they called Peanut lost his 64-hour fight for life today. So frail a life, so brief a time, but Jerry Bowen reports that to doctors, to the hospital staff, to the world, in the words of Peanut's father, that infant brought a spirit and a love. Peanut surprised a lot of people. They didn't expect him to have 24 hours. The smallest of the six Fru Stacy babies, Baby F, the one pound boy nicknamed Peanut, began to succumb to respiratory complications several hours after these pictures were taken yesterday afternoon. The mother, Patty, still isolated from the infants, and the father, Sam, were warned of the trouble by doctors. When the doctor came, I thought that it was all over. And he said that there's something about this kid that he's really got to fight, that he's made out of steel, that he refuses to die. Like all the Frustaci infants, baby F was much smaller than a full-term child, but was also dramatically different from the five siblings born ahead of him. This baby's umbilical cord was almost non-existent. Had this baby been in utero one more day, it too would have been a stillborn. The hardest thing for Patty is the fact that she never got a chance to see him when he was living. The 30-year-old mother remains in intensive care under close observation today, her own recovery set back by the death of the boy a baby she was able to hold only after its death. Patty did spend approximately one hour with her baby, spending time just to get to know the baby that she really hadn't been able to see. The surviving three boys and two girls are still in critical condition, still struggling with respiratory complications, essentially unchanged from yesterday. A joint funeral is now planned for baby F and baby G, the female infant stillborn Tuesday. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Orange, California. Shiite Muslim militiamen now allied with Lebanese army troops today swept through two Palestinian refugee camps in Beirut. Palestinian guerrillas forced from those camps took refuge in the ruins of a nearby hospital and were under siege. A third camp still held by the Palestinians was expected to fall soon. Larry Pentak in Damascus has more on this. Fighting was sporadic today as Shiite militiamen slowly tightened the noose on the Palestinians. At Borjo Barajni, the camp with the largest concentration of PLO commandos, the Shiites spent much of their time firing blindly in the general direction of the enemy. As the gunmen advanced in the narrow alleys, PLO hiding places were systematically destroyed. Five days of fighting has left the camp scarred. Hundreds of families, both Palestinians and Shiites, 
have been driven from their homes, more flee during each lull. Grim rumors of widespread slaughter have been filtering out of two other camps, Sabra and Shatila, where a handful of PLO fighters are said to be mounting a last stand. The Red Cross and reporters have been kept out. Hospitals are jammed with dead and wounded, but scores of other casualties are said to be trapped inside the camps. The Shiite fighters are being backed by Muslim units of the Lebanese army. Their aim is to drive the PLO commandos out of Beirut. As many as 2,000 have slipped back in over the past few years. The Shiites suffered under Palestinian domination when the PLO was in charge. Now West Beirut is their turf, and they're determined not to let anyone challenge their rule. Larry Pintak, CBS News, Damascus. There were violent demonstrations at five South Korean universities today as students demonstrated in support of the takeover of the U.S. Information Service building in Seoul. About 73 Korean students are barricaded in the building's library and have vowed a fast to the end to protest what they say is U.S. support of South Korean government repression. The students, who have threatened to kill themselves if police move in, ignored the U.S. ambassador's appeal to end the occupation. The U.S. Army today announced the cutoff of all overhead expense payments, about a million dollars a day, to Hughes Helicopter Incorporated. The reason? What the Army calls serious charges of padded bills and slipshod accounting involving millions of dollars. In one instance, allegedly billing the Pentagon for two million dollars in bonuses paid to Hughes executives so they would stay on when the firm was taken over by the nation's largest defense contractor, McDonnell Douglas, last year. McDonnell Douglas said tonight, the problems and deficiencies were corrected when it took over Hughes. But an Army spokesman disputes that. Hughes holds a multi-billion dollar contract for the Apache attack helicopter. The Internal Revenue Service conceded for the first time today that it expects to pay a record amount of penalty interest this year on tax refunds checks it mailed out late. The reason? Partly because of nagging and continuing computer snafus. But as Susan Spencer reports, that isn't the only reason the IRS refund check isn't in the mail and why you may be back at square one. If you filed your taxes early and figure your big fat refund is in the mail, think again. It may be, or it may be, that the IRS has no record that you filed at all. The IRS concedes that in part due to its new computer system, more taxpayers than ever before will have to file twice this year. It doesn't know how many. The problem, computers at the local centers sometimes hold up a return without ever telling the national computer they have done so. That's what's happening is that return has not gone all the way through the system for us to have a record to, to comment to a taxpayer. So it's there somewhere. Yes, it is. <laughs> so it's not right to say it's lost. No it, not, no, it certainly is not. But you can't find it. Today. <laughs> what to do? The IRS says be patient, hang on. If after 10 weeks there's no refund, call them. Good luck. If they have no record, they say don't panic. It may turn up. Wait until 16 weeks after filing and then call again. Accountant Fred Ware finally got through, having waited for his refund since February. They had no record of filing my return, so at the beginning of this week, I ended up having to file a duplicate return. I've been filing returns now for some 23 years, and it's the first time anything like this ever happened to me. The IRS says please call twice to be sure the return really has vanished and don't send a duplicate otherwise. The last thing it needs this year is extra tax returns. Susan Spencer, CBS News, Washington. On the other end of the taxpayer pipeline, more angry words today on the federal budget approved by the House. President Reagan today attacked the House for passing a budget that takes no cuts in Social Security cost of living increases, but takes new slices out of defense spending increases. It is frankly unacceptable. It's unacceptable to me and to the American people. House sponsors claim that their plan will, plan will save some $56 billion. In fact, billions of those savings would come from what could only be charitably described as phantom cuts. The struggle in rural Utah today is centuries old. Man will endure, but he will hardly win. And who do you blame? Nature? The government? Bob McNamara has been there. They are chewing up the wheat and the rice grass of northeastern Utah and heading toward Idaho's rich potato crop. Called Mormon crickets, the thumb-sized critters are gathering in herds of 100 and more per square yard and marching across highways and rangeland in long, dark waves, there seems no stopping them. 
It's real frustrating because they just keep coming. Thought to be the first wave of an almost annual spring insect invasion, the crickets last year devoured about 18,000 acres of one Utah County's crops. But this year, ranchers can hardly believe their eyes. It's much, much worse than it's been other years already. It, <laughs> yes, they definitely bug you. They, they're, uh, you saw how excited and nervous I was. I don't like, I'm having a hard time standing still here. <laughs> but what bugs ranchers more is the fact that little federal money was available last year for spraying the insects. And now that the money is ready to be spent for this year's insecticide spraying, the crickets are already on the run. Oh, right now, I think we're losing, but uh, we're hoping to get some help from aircraft and be able to really do a spraying job. Legend has it that when Utah's early Mormon settlers' crops were attacked by crickets, seagulls came to the rescue by eating the crickets and saving the crops. But today, there were no seagulls in sight. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Vernal, Utah. reported as we came on the air that agreement had been reached tonight on the major issues in the United Airlines strike. Sources now tell CBS News reporter Ned Potter in Chicago that what's preventing announcement of full settlement of the strike are such issues as what to do with the people who have been hired during the strike and where they will fit into the seniority scale. Negotiators say all that could soon be resolved, but United would not speculate on how long it would take to roll planes and personnel back into place and resume full service when and if there's an official announcement of a full settlement. Planes fill the air here in Seattle today. There were no passengers, no cargo, no crew. And as Richard Wagner explains, virtually no restrictions on the pilots. The venue was Seattle's King Dome for the second great international paper airplane contest. The first was held in an airplane hangar here 18 years ago. Entries came from all over the U.S. and more than 20 other countries. Japan sent some 300, the most from any foreign country. The planes were judged on time aloft, distance of flight, aerobatics, and aesthetic quality. The judges included former astronaut Michael Collins. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not here looking for any deep message. It's just a fun time. The plane's builders were not present. A designated thrower in each category theoretically gave each entrant an equal chance. The results were, well, mixed. Whoa. Oops. Oh, golly. <laughs> when it was all over, Japanese planes won eight of the ten prizes, including all the aerobatics, aesthetics, and time aloft. They must be doing it better over there than we are, at least with paper. One winner today from the United States won the same distance prize in the first great international paper airplane contest back in 1967. Robert Muser of Oakland, California. I must be doing something right. I just wish, wish I knew what. <laughs> Today's winning time aloft was just over 16 seconds, six seconds longer than in 1967. Today's planes flew farther, too. There was no prize for most bizarre design, but if there had been, Japan had that one covered as well. Richard Wagner. CBS News, Seattle. Dan Rather, CBS News, reporting for the International Edition. Thank you for joining us.